Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Katie Helper Show. I'm your host, Katie Helper, and you can, of course, hear the Katie Helper Show every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on WBAI. That's 99.5 FM, WBAI.org. And I'm joined by... The one and only. If you don't know me by now, you never will. Uh, let's keep it a mystery, unless you feel like they need to know, Katie. Well, they may need to know, Gabe Pacheco, who you are, oh, but it's up to you. Oh, there totally it is. I've there, been I did it. I did I've it. Been I've doxed. been Yeah, I, I doxed Gabe. Ladies and gentlemen, without my consent, my yeah. name was thrown out there. All right. By the way, please make sure that you uh, join our Patreon campaign. You get bonus episodes if you join for $5 a, m- a month. That's so little money. That's What is that? It's like a, a, a dollar and a quarter, basically, a week. Oh, that's like half a cold brew. Yeah. That's half a cold brew. Half You're a not cold even. Brew. Yeah. Come on, guys. Would you buy me in appreciation of the of this show? Would you buy me and Gabe um let's see, uh $5 a month of what the a drink every month? Yeah, just an apple teeny a month. And a- oh, it's I mean half of an apple teeny a month, right. right? Half an apple teeny a month. Or let's say you don't have a lot of money. You know what you can do? Why don't you pay a dollar a month? That's twelve dollars a year, guys. This is insane. Everyone who ever listens to the show should be paying twelve dollars a year, right? Yeah, that's. You, come on, guys. Come on, that's buying me two a drinks dirty a dozen. year. A dirty dozen for two dirty martinis. That's like a quarter. You guys, literally a quarter a week. You know yeah. what? I can't stand our listeners who don't pay that. What are you <laughs> doing? You can afford a quarter a week, really, guys. All right, I know this isn't the best. Gabe, you're good at this psychology stuff. That's not the best way to get people to give, but. Come on, a quarter a week. Hey, man, we appreciate and we love you guys. We, uh, love we you just guys. need, you know, uh, help help us keep bringing you this high quality, raw, uncut content. This raw onion, so many layers, sometimes makes you cry. Raw onion of a show that is the Katie Helper Show. Mm-hmm. And to do that, you just go to patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. And you get bonus content, extended interviews. You get to hear uh, extended interview, for instance, with Tom, Miss Frank, just all sorts of great goodies. And we appreciate it. You get to sleep well at night. So we have a great show for you today. We're going to be talking to Anoa Changa. She is a podcast host. Her show is called The Way with Anoa. Uh, Gabe, what's what's up with you? What's up with the cult, pop cultural landscape? What's happening? In, in well, you, you know, reside? I haven't had a, a ton of time to, to pay attention to the pop culture because I was so, so busy uh, celebrating your birthday. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's 7-11, and that's a big deal. You should know that date. You know, lots of people on the left. We know September 11th, 1973, the Chilean coup, circling right. back to former episode both less fun dates much less fun so after you commemorate those dates and honor them and have a moment of silence right you can have a moment of celebration yes on september 11th yes on july 11th sorry not so (laughs) did i say september 11th yeah yeah right no one is going to be celebrating on september 11th guys Despite uh, donald trump slams that some muslims in new jersey were not true yeah you heard it here first hot take don't celebrate 9-11 Right. Either one, the Chilean or the World Trade Center. But, Do celebrate 7-Eleven, Katie Halper's birthday. Right. Another less fun holiday, celebration, commemoration, Hiroshima Day. Hiroshima was August 6th. And when was Nagasaki? I just want to uh, acknowledge them. Poor Nagasaki. You know, Nagasaki always gets the short end of the stick. Yeah, people don't even talk about it. They don't. And they're like, guys, us too. Yeah. They're like the Tobago in Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah. Like, people just call it Trinidad. Or the when Michael Jackson died. This always happens when a celebrity dies. Mm. Uh, the bigger... if You don't yes. want to die the same day as a celebrity because their death will trump yours. So right. Farrah Fawcett died the same day as Michael Jackson. But Poor very Farrah. few people commemorated that because they were swept up in... Uh, right. In the Jacko fever. Right. I believe Johnny Cash and John Ritter died on the same day. Uh, we should do a whole episode on this. You know uh, who else died on the same day? Jim Henson and Sammy Davis Jr. Ooh, who won that battle? Well, I was a kid, so Jim Henson. Right. But right. I think it depends on... There may have been a generational who, gap. Yes. Generation gap, a demographic split. Um, uh, by the way, so Nagasaki is August... Hold on. Wait for it. August 9th. Okay. You yeah. guys, if we, uh, if you all find a way to donate some money to the Patreon, it might go towards getting us an intern. Yeah, or a researcher who's that's uh, right, yeah. who yeah. just show, who's in the room. Yeah, exactly. Um, and silently searching, manically and manically frantically, silently searching really hard things to find, like the dates of uh, the bombings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. 
Um, you know, my summer camp, Kinderland, where I made the documentary about Kami Camp, uh, we, we commemorate Hiroshima Day. It's very, very touching and moving to watch the kids do it. Um, it's a little weird because we wake them up really early, dress them all up in white, and um, march them down to the waterfront. Very morbid. And this very is before morbid. breakfast. Before so breakfast, you, yeah. You, you wait, every, somebody comes into that the Camp Kinderland yeah. uh, uh, bunk room mm-hmm. and bangs bunks. Pot, the bunks and bangs pots and pans <laughs> no, and they yells don't at the kids to wake up. They it's don't bang pots and pans. very full metal jacket for a bunch of little Jewish kids. And yeah. they're like, what? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And they all no. got to stand up. And uh, run outside. No, th- no pots and pans that day. In fact, it's <laughs> silence. It's silence. Uh, yeah. And for, I just do want to say Camp Kinderland, it's not all Jewish. Lots of Jutinos, lots of bluish, that's black and Jewish, and some just non Jewish at all, or, or people of color at all. We even have some wasps that we let in. It's kind of weird. Um, all inclusive. All inclusive, yeah. But from the beginning, there were, there were black campers and, uh, and counselors. And I'm talking about 1923. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. That's progress. That's that's pre-progress. Yeah. That's yeah. That's forward that's, thinking. Forward thinking. Super woke. But yeah, it is a little rough, and everyone's wearing white, which is the Japanese color of mourning. Sure. Once, actually, famously, the cultural director, um, I guess he it was his day off, which is kind of weird because that should that was that's kind of your lane, like directing that commemoration, and I guess he forgot about it, so we were all silent, and he, this guy. Uh, I, I won't name any names, but he was like Don't doing laps. Him. He was just doing laps in the lake and kind of loudly swimming around. I think before realizing what was happening. Anyway, sure. he's doing b- the butterfly stroke. <laughs> yeah, the and really he... silent butterfly stroke. <laughs> looks at the shore and there's just a bunch of like ghost children, ghost children dressed, dressed in, in white. white. Yeah. <laughs> And then, like, the counselors in training make an announcement about what happened. And They don't even get a real counselor. They get one of yeah, the, exactly. the counselors the learning. in training. Yeah. The rookies. The rookies. Then we break into the song, Hiroshima Girl, which is a little rough, I think. It's like a first-person song um, about a girl killed in Hiroshima. And, and the, the chorus is, For I am dead, for I am dead. I knock and yet remain unseen For I am We do sing Where Have All the Flowers Gone, and that's appropriate. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time passing. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time ago. Yeah, we've been celebrating all week, every day. Every, all day, every day. Yeah, that's right. 24-7. That's right. Like an Indian wedding. Uh-huh. Have a birthday celebration. You got, yeah. You're like, oh, is it still going on? Yeah. I went to sleep uh, in the middle of the party. I woke up. The party's happening. Still going. Uh, I rode in on, a, on an elephant. Yes, you did. A little pygmy elephant. <laughs> what's a pygmy elephant? It's a smaller elephant. Is that really what's yeah. called? Yeah, because oh, you're dainty. So you don't need a full, <laughs> full grown G- elephant. Gabe Pacheco making history by calling me dainty. Uh, that's sweet. <laughs> that's cute. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, but pop culture wise, so uh, you know, I I watched the pilot of the FX show Snowfall, and mm. man, I had a great time watching that. That was um, it's a uh, uh, ground zero year one for uh, the introduction of crack into the United States, and so uh, you know the show is still unfolding. It's just the pilot, but what I found interesting was that they acknowledged the. Um, Nicaraguan Contras as uh, being some of the chief uh, traffickers, at least early on, um, get bringing those kilos into the U.S. of that raw uncut mm. because uh, they needed funding for their to kill people. Uh, counter war mm-hmm. against the Sandinista government. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. They needed money, and uh, I don't think Congress was um, was greenlighting that money yet. And uh, we see their murky relationship with the CIA operatives who are in Los Angeles and how they give their tacit approval at first for um, them to sell, for the Nicaraguan Contras to sell cocaine to fund their war, which was all a war against communism. Right. Anything in the name of uh, the fight against communism. So they were cannibalizing the, um, the American population. Uh, and getting them hooked on drugs to generate revenue to buy arms right. to stop 
to stop uh, what the the Red Armies, the Reds, yeah, the Sandinistas, yeah, in the Third World. Interesting, Gabe, that you bring up the Contras because um, you know you know there's this woman named Joy Reid. She has her own show on MSNBC called Morning Joy. Very, it's cute because her name is Joy Reid. It's a little bit of a pun. Um, and she is it an uplifting and happy show? It is. I mean, it's oh, she's yeah, she's always talking about Trump. Uh, she's a big Bernie Sanders hater. It's interesting. She actually used to like Bernie Sanders. She she praised him once in a tweet, but things have gone south. And she she writes anti Sanders and anti left tweets all the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, when she's not doing her show, she's just yeah. like stuck to her her smartphone. Yeah, I've tweeted at her. She's never responded to me. Some people will respond to my tweeting her, and they're like, you guys need to stop. Both sides need to stop. Like, yeah, that's a very parallel, like, very symmetrical. Increase the peace. Yeah. Why don't you tell her, the one with, like, who's smearing Bernie Sanders publicly? She really, but she really goes after him in, like, an embarrassing way. You know, I'll go after people, you may have noticed, but I don't have a show uh, on MSNBC, and I also don't have, like, let's see how many followers she has. I do not have... Dun 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 dun. Six hundred and ninety-nine thousand followers. That's an army. How many of those are real people? I don't know. It's a good question. You know, because you can buy followers. It's true. Maybe those could be bots. Those could be bot tro- bots. They are purchased. Yeah, uh, it, it it it's a little bit weird, honestly. Oh, the difference that working at MSNBC will make. Because uh, she, in 2010, said, revising my tweet from yesterday, the great clarion voice in the Democratic Party is Bernie Sanders, and he'll be ignored just like Dean. The other day, fast forward a couple years, and... And this was in 2010. This was in 2010, yeah. And uh, just in June of 2017, she wrote, uh, Bernie and his followers are like that college friend who stays at your place for weeks, pays zero dollars, eats your food, and trashes your aesthetic. Uh, which is like a little bit, you know, anti-Semitic, or at least it's anti-Semitism. Because adjacent. Jews go to college. Well, that too, but because Jews crash on your couch. Jews are considered cheap parasites. Ah, uh, right. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. She's not saying she's an anti-Semite. I'm saying that if someone said something as close to sexist as that is as close to anti-Semitic, she would flip her ish. Yeah, you know. And like I, you know, I'm going to look at it through a not worried about anti-Semitism lens myself because uh, because you know I don't want to. I, I just feel like um, at the same time she's calling him a freeloader. Right. What's that? What's that about? And what's her? What What does she care about aesthetics? Right. What does that mean? I'm just. I just don't think the tweet makes any sense. Ah, uh, okay. Got it. Outside of that, even uh, it's still. It's still a garbage tweet. Oh, yeah. It's a garbage tweet anyway. I like the way you just owned not caring about anti-Semitism. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not my lane to... Right. Look, That's know. why I don't care about when they call you a bunch of rapists, <laughs> you Mexicans. It's like, it's not my problem. Yeah, you let me deal with that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you don't need to defend me. No way. No, we don't believe in solidarity on the Katie Helper show. <laughs> We're not intersectional. We don't think... Um, well, I, my, you know, I, you can know. St- I can stand up for myself on that. And I know you, you're definitely better at uh, Twitter than I am, so you can, you can handle the anti-Semitism. Right. Well, it's just fun for me to be able to call out anyone on anti-Semitism, but given that it's usually like Zionists, hawkish Zionists, who are accusing people of anti-Semitism, and I'm usually saying, no, that's not anti-Semitism, that's, that's just valid criticism of Israel. But it's really fun to be able to call out um, the people who, I mean, there is low-key anti-Semitism, I mean. Um, and people, I love when people make the argument that Sanders couldn't have won because he's Jewish, but you can't say that Hillary wouldn't have won because she's a woman and there's clearly sexism, right? Right. As much sexism as there is anti-Semitism. So if you say that about Hillary, you're sexist. If you say that about Bernie, you're just a pragmatist. Same thing about Keith Ellison. He couldn't have won because he was Muslim. Again, that's okay to say, according to people. But then we have to remember that our, that the last president who won two elections was named Barack Hussein, Hussein Obama. Obama. And was black. Yes. So, yeah, there goes that thesis. Um, so what happened was that Joy Reid, um, Matt Iglesias is this guy who uh, is at Vox, was one of the founders of Vox. He's an editor of Vox, and he's a writer of Vox. He also went to high school with me. We took Russian fiction together uh, senior year elective. And he wrote this piece. He was a big Clinton supporter and Sanders critic during the primary. And he came out with this piece uh, July 5th called Bernie Sanders is the Democrats' real 2020 frontrunner. He's staffing up, touring the country, and still drawing record crowds. And he makes the argument that uh, he he says if if he were 10 or 20 years younger, um, 
his absence from a 2020 cattle call held by the Center for American Progress back in May would have been glaring. As things stood, the whisper among everyone in the halls was simply that he's too old and obviously won't run. Um, so it's kind of like a backhanded compliment. It's like uh, or, or forward-handed diss. Matt Iglesias is basically saying, like, he'd be great, but too bad he's too old. So it's kind of like... I mean, our life expectancy keeps rising and rising and rising. I mean, not for most people now that uh, now that the economy is so bad, but right. you can live... I mean, if you're, if you're uh, affluent, you can live a long time. Or, I mean, despite the lake house thing, I don't know what nootropics uh, Bernie Sanders is taking, but he's a vigorous man. He's a long-distance runner, and he's a, a clean, a clear bill of health, right? Yeah. I mean, but Donald Trump looks bloated. He looks like he has gout or something, <laughs> uh, I, I think. But but Matt, come on, Matt. He has a bunch of subsections, and he's like, you know, Bernie Sanders has a clear message. Sanders is quietly moderating. Sanders is building his team. Nobody thought Bernie Sanders could win. Um, and uh, if not him, who? Uh, it's time to take Bernie Sanders seriously. And then, uh, you know, he just very, in a very nuanced way, says Bernie Sanders is very old. So people, he's not, I mean, he's n- he's not a leftist at all. He's a total liberal. And it's hilarious to watch liberals freak out about this article and pile on him, like, on Twitter, like he's literally like Trotsky or something. I mean, they they view so him as such a traitor. Are upset that, that he yeah. likes, uh, he admires some of Bernie Sanders' um, exactly, or is, is calling him kind of somewhat electable, even though, but for his age, right? Yeah. But even even that is too much. You can't even say that like his ideas are good or appealing. Uh, you can't even say you know he would not have uh, gotten ele- ele- He can't get elected because of his age. Like that's too pro. Right. Sanders. So people are freaking out. And and one of the people freaking out is Joy Reid. And she tweeted, Matt also managed to write a lot of words without addressing a single Sanders negative. Parentheses, the FBI investigation, praise of the Sandinistas. Um, Praise of the Sandinistas. First of all, who knows what the Sandinistas are? I mean, we do. You and I do. Because we're into Latin American history and human rights atrocities committed by the United States in the name of anti-communism. Um, so there's two things. One is that she, this is a non-issue. No one cares about this. The second one is like, she's implying that it's problematic to support the Sandinistas. Maybe if the people that they weren't fighting were the Contras who have tons of blood on their hands. You know what I mean? It's not like the Sandinistas. Death squads. Yeah. Death squads. Big time. It's not like the Sandinistas versus like Otpor, the, you know, civil disobedience, civil resistance group in, in Serbia. (laughs) You know, it's not like, um. Sandinistas versus the the Greens. Well, it kind of feels like uh, in uh, England, labor when yeah. uh, Corbyn they were um, they were saying that Corbyn was uh, like a uh, an admirer of Sinn Fein, yeah, uh, in the IRA, and uh, and now you know uh, what is it? Ireland, parts of Ireland are independent, and uh, those guys aren't seen as that Terrorist, bad, right? Yeah, yeah. They're like the political wing of the IRA, but yeah, they're they're seen as being legit now. Um, so I tweeted that I I thought like Joy Reid should run on the Contras ticket, and I would mail in like a decapitated peasant head or torture manual to cast my vote. Uh, <laughs> you know, I would vote vote for her that way. Yeah. Also, shout outs to uh, the Contras for helping introduce crack cocaine to yeah, the United exactly. States. Yeah, exactly. Coming full circle. Um, that that didn't have any um uh, long term. Uh, ramifications right, for exactly. uh, our civilian population. Not at all. Or crime or, yeah, innocent bystanders or, yeah. I know some people are like, why are you spending time on Twitter? Who cares about Twitter? It's not the real life. And well, as we, as I... I vigorously follow uh, your your flame wars on yeah. Twitter. Uh, I also follow a couple other people, but I have no idea how to, how, how to make Twitter work myself. It feels like the WWF promos mm. where, where uh, you just have wrestlers yelling at one another and battling but uh it's yeah but I, I i can't get involved i'm just a spectator okay good to know i will not rely on you to either battle anti-semitism or <laughs> uh defend me on twitter but uh I'll like i'll like press no the it's hard true button. i've seen you like it yeah um so you know I, people sometimes are like what's the point two points of, of engaging in twitter fights one is that um all the time that someone like nero tandon spends dragging 
and Neera Tandon is the head of the uh, Center for American Progress, a major liberal think tank. She was probably going to – everyone thought she'd be Hillary Clinton's chief of staff. She's almost – she has a kind of um, – she has a Donald Trump-like Twitter style. Like she kind of can't control herself. It's weird. Uh, so this is someone who uh, you talk to, you interface with a lot yes, on Twitter. Yes, although she she has blocked me. Um, she plays with my heart. She quit playing games with my heart near. Does so. she unblock you yeah, and then block you exactly. and then unblock you? Yeah. Oh, wow. Exactly. So you guys have a real hot and cold relationship. Yeah, yeah. It's hot and heavy, yeah. A push and pull. It's uh, some uh, liberal, hot left liberal on uh, leftist girl-girl action. All the time that someone like Nero Tandon spends dragging people like me or responding to people like me on Twitter, that's less time she has to pitch her uh, brilliant plan to make countries that we help um, destabilize, like Libya, pay us back. That's great. That's like uh, telling a rape victim they have to pay for their rape kit. Yeah, it's true. In fact, I think Sarah Palin did that. She she did want people, uh, she wanted them to have to pay for that. Nero Tandon's justification is that Americans will pay uh, will support future wars only if they see that the countries attacked by the U.S. pay for their invasions. <laughs> there was this email that said, um, literally, and this was in, in relation to uh, Libya. They have a giant deficit. They have a lot of oil. Most Americans would choose not to engage in the world because of that deficit. If we want to continue to engage in the world, gestures like having oil-rich countries partially pay us back doesn't seem crazy to me. Do we prefer cuts to Head Start or WIC or Medicaid? Because we live in deficit politics, and that's what is happening and will be happening even more. Um, it's kind of amazing, basically. Head Start or uh, make countries that we destabilize pay us back so that war is sellable. Thank you, Neera Tandon. We are very excited to be talking to Anoa Changa. Um, she is a lawyer She's a, a kind of a renaissance woman. She is a podcast host. She lives in Atlanta. She's a, a progressive warrior, I would say. Anoa, welcome to the Katie Halper Show. Katie, that was an awesome introduction. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you. Yeah. On with you. Thank you. In fact, one of the questions I had for you was how you describe yourself. And I, I asked that part, well, I'm I'm curious, but also because... Um, I feel like I have a similar thing where I do a lot of different things, and sometimes right. people are like, I don't get it. What do you do? So, yeah, I was wondering it how you... Sounds like my parents. I'm trying to explain, it's like, what do you do? Like, I'm going to say, as Katie Halper has said. <laughs> yeah, put it on your business card. Put it on your uh, website. website. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. You and Michael Salamone um, just launched a project called Media Revolt. And, again, uh, her her show is The Way with Anoa, which is a weekly talk show and podcast. And that focuses on politics, news, and community engagement. Uh, you were quoted in an article in The Observer. It's called, The Democratic Party Needs to Address the Passive Racism in Their Own Ranks. Aiding marginalized communities right. when it's politically expedient isn't enough. And in this article, you say, you're quoted, in order to be truly transformational and revolutionary, the quote-unquote progressive movement cannot hide its head in the sand on matters of racial equity and justice. If we are to address oppression where it exists and build opportunities for, for the 99%, we cannot cherry pick which causes are of importance. This is not about weaponizing shallow statements of identity, but a reflection that there are that there are systemic issues that marginalize and oppress black people and others in this country. The current system was based on racial and economic oppression and exploitation. The two are intertwined and cannot be separated going forward. Um, so can you expand on what you uh, what you were saying in this article? Um, yeah, definitely. Like, And, you know, some people have taken these conversations when we start trying to address issues of systemic racism and, and inequality within movement building spaces where, you know, I, I am so proud of the growth. I'm proud of the progress in many respects that we've made. The fact that we can truly have these conversations, right, as compared to the late 1890s when folks like Ida B. Wells, Barnett were, were organizing and mobilizing and doing work. I mean, we, we've seen that there is a historical issue with racism internally to our movement building work. And does that mean that everyone who's white or non-black in spaces is awful and evil and we want to, you know, just take over and get rid of them, but at the same time acknowledging that there are the same system that we're fighting against that's oppressive and has all these other issues, you know, some of those, some of that has trickled down 
into the systems that we ourselves build when we're trying to work against, um, you know, whatever struggle it is we're, we're talking about. And so, and just reflecting on history, reflecting on how, how you know, you know, James Baldwin and, and um, you know, these boys have both written about this, you know, in their writing with the nation about, you know, continued issues, even within their own movement building work in a certain space, these boys um, writing about why it made no sense for black people to vote with either the major parties at the time, advocating for either a blank out or voting for a third party, um, and James and James Baldwin reflections, uh, you know, looking at this just just the continued role in issues in the sixties with, with with race, even in so called liberal spaces. And here we are now, twenty seventeen, we've had several years of movement building work, even before Bernie Sanders, you know, announced a political revolution that is really taking a life of its own. And, and we saw from that first interruption at Net Group during the campaign, when the campaign was just kicking off in the primary process, uh, was that two summers ago? Um, and, and then later we saw the, the BLM disruption in Seattle, and we've seen some other disruptions of both candidates, um, you know, during the, during the process. But the abysmal reaction, you know, from folks within the movement, and, and I've been told by some people, like, oh, that's just a fringe issue. Most people don't think that way. But there really is a reluctance by, by many folks across various um, progressive institutional spaces, whether they're media personalities, you know, journals, or their actual organizations, to not really address, really deeply address, you know, issues involving racial justice, racial equity, really deep, deep, deep in, you know, getting deep in there. And a lot of times, you know, valid concerns that are often raised are brushed aside as identity politics. Now, I do not disagree that within the Democratic Party, within so-called neoliberal spaces, there is a tendency to use, you know, one's identity as a shield from valid criticism. I mean, we've seen people falling all over themselves because of criticism that has been levied at Kamala Harris, for example. There is legitimate criticism of her, you know, role as California Attorney General, as her time as a prosecutor in California, that has nothing to do with her being a black woman, and she should not be shielded right. because of that, right? But at the same time, there are valid issues in terms of race, ethnic oppression. You know, there are, are valid issues that aren't quote unquote identity. And we often see, you know, different organizations, different groups, different people, you know, shutting down conversations like, oh, that's just identity politics. We just need to focus on class. Class is not going to lift all of us up because there are structural and systemic issues based on race, based on national origin, based on these other issues that, that, that have to also be addressed. So while I agree that, you know, focusing on a shallow identity politics is problematic, we really do need to dig deep within our organizational efforts, within our movement building, to address these issues that are persisting because, you know, health care for all is fabulous, but there are also structural and racial inequity issues that exist, particularly when you're talking about, you know, the South. I mean, the same type of conversation I'm having in terms of racial equity applies when we're talking about eight places like Appalachia. It's the same systemic oppressive spaces, and if we're not going to really dig deep to address these issues, we're not going to really help lift anyone up. We're just going to keep, you know, putting a Band-Aid on a larger problem. So, I mean, it seems like what it often comes down to with uh, identity politics is the idea uh, that economic solutions or economic uh, justice is necessary but insufficient. Right. And And what liberals try to pretend is that it's uh, it's just insufficient, and so we shouldn't do it, right? Or it's not going to help everything or solve everything, so let's not do it. Which mm-hmm. is like liberals would never say that about uh, equal pay or affirmative action, right? Liberals would never say, well, equal pay isn't going to solve every gender form of gender uh, oppression, all sexism, so let's not do it. Or, well, affirmative action isn't going to erase racism, so let's not do it, right? It's a, that's an absurd argument. But that's basically what there's a lot of liberals are saying about economic justice. I absolutely agree with you in terms of the economic justice. We, I mean, again, going back to the Bernie Sanders campaign, because and I, I go back to Bernie's campaign, not because, as some people, you know, falsely accuse Katie, myself and other people of being like, oh, my God, Bernie's our God. And everything Bernie says is absolutely the truth. And we can't think for ourselves. And we were relitigating the primary, et cetera. Right, right, right. Not not at all. But it's value is showing a really prime example yeah. of when these major economic issues were being put on a major yes. stage and challenged in a very concrete way by a large group of people, right? And so we would have the backlash because Bernie, 
you know, did not do as well with the language of racial justice. You know, Hillary Clinton can speak, you know, you know, racial allies very well. The, the, what, what, what actually, the proof is in the pudding, though, right? And I actually even had someone say that to me in one of my earliest interviews when I was with Women for Bernie, was that, well, Bernie doesn't know how to talk to us. That might be true, and it's something that he and others still struggle with, but at the same time, you cannot deny that when you're talking about pushing for Fight for 15, right. pushing for uh, health care for all, push, pushing for these different issues that are most definitely going to benefit us. Even when you look at, you know, the attempts to do the HBCU tour. Historically black uh, colleges and universities, yeah. That was engaging young black millennials and then doing, you know, tours around the neighboring towns. Like, there was a lot of effort. Now, we can get into what the shortcomings were. were. That was a whole other other conversation. But we we saw the backlash and the attempt to sabotage efforts that were being done by the staff um, because that doesn't matter to black people. He's not talking about black issues. It is so disheartening. It is so, it is so disheartening. It is so upsetting to see people when we when we talk about the south for example right when we look at the largest population in poverty in the south are black you know when we look at the percentage of people of black women in poverty it, it's more than any other you know group of women in the south mm-hmm. you know when we look at you know fight for 15 fight for 15 is pro- primarily black and latino workers who right. have been at the forefront of that movement when we look at you know disproportionate access to adequate health care and affordability issues we look at school finance issues right like the one thing that was really great that i wish the burning campaign had touched on is by the time they were getting to illinois um troy la Rivera, uh uh the principal who's sitting in from a manual um mm-hmm. in chicago there was a lot of discussion like leading up to that 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 primary about the way in which illinois and chicago and how wall street you know risky uh investments and stuff actually undermine school funding and we know that hmm. school funding is is, 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 is at that issue. You're disproportionately affecting black, brown, and poor communities. So there, there were these discussions that, that were happening that because mainstream media froze, you know, the campaign and a lot of these issues out, we got people then repeating the same BS talking points as if the fact that Bernie did not get talking to black people right was the only was the only focus. And so I understand the pushback and I understand why people find a need to dig in real deep on the economic justice issues. However, if we're truly the transformational wave and movement, we have to move beyond our frustration with those other people on the other side, so to speak, and really be able to have the broader conversation that needs to be had. So yes, we we often see liberals, neoliberals, whatever our terminology of art is to such people. You know, we do see them dismissing economic justice efforts as if it's not good enough, as if it doesn't matter. And that's simply not the case. I mean, you, you tend to have people who benefit from the current system doing so. All of the rest of us know that we're in the same boat. However, there are also these other systems internally that we also have to address. So we have to start moving our dialogue into a broader realm. Yes, we have different people who specialize. Some folks are, are really focused on, you know, Citizens United, Wall Street, you know, reform and things of that nature. And that is great. But we need to be able to break that down as to why that matters to the to the mother or to the father or to the elderly person that's on a fixed income that's just trying to make it, you know, day to day for their family. Why do these other things we're talking about even matter? We need to be able to do better to connect the different aspects of our struggle to truly build a movement of the 99 percent as people talk about. And, and, and we have to dig in deep. It's not enough for people to say, well, I marched in the 60s or I've done so much for black people. Great. Your, your work is not over keep working it's just so funny it's like again if you wanted to say like sanders uh isn't being you know his language isn't woke enough or he's not framing this well fine that's one thing but if you're saying that and you're also ignoring the fact that for instance we're going to use the primary just as a teachable moment right the fact that hillary did not support the fight for 15 at the beginning how mm-hmm. how are you supposed to have any cred like you how do you not understand right. that that's a, an issue for women and for people of color right absolutely i mean absolutely like like we just talked about the entire battle over the economic justice conversation it was and it's particularly given the history of people of color of women of you know members of the lgbtq community yeah. in these struggles across the board all of us have been a part of every major you know, battle for equality and equity in this country since its inception. So to act like there is, there is nothing for black people in an economic justice conversation when 
Martin Luther King, yes. you know, at, 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 in his, his later years, you know, at the time of his death, was organizing sanitation workers in, in, in Tennessee, right? right. Like, we, 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 we have, we have there, there is history of folks in the 30s, in the 20s and 30s, in terms of organizing with um, sharecroppers. I mean, I just read something recently about, you know, uh, uh, the Communist Party and organizing with, with Black organizers in the earlier part of the 20th century in terms of economic and racial work. Yeah. So the history is there. Our movements have been intersectional in these ways before there was that word that existed. Yes. We just need to get back to do And we can't let these different pundits and so-called thought leaders of Twitter get in the way of the work that we're trying to do. Katie and I were just talking about this, how disheartening it is sometimes with the way people, you know, posture for Twitter and set out these damaging narratives like we've been discussing about how economic justice is irrelevant um, or doesn't matter or, you know, Bernie's just trying to, Bernie's a charlatan is just trying to steal our money, you know. Right. I whether Bernie has particular character flaws or not is really not my concern. What is my concern is that we have people with large platforms, yes. whether they're on TV or they're on, you know, social media, informing tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, in some cases millions of viewers. They're misinforming and miseducating people about real issues that are affecting our community. And in our organizing work, we have to cover the gap. And I know we are, we're underfunded. But we, we have people power, right? right. And, and and we can't we can't just get so stuck on proving them wrong on this one issue that matters to us that we lose sight of these other content areas that we need to be discussing and building on. I think it's really important because the idea that like multiracial organizing is not possible, um, is something mm-hmm. or doesn't have a precedent, like you said, right? And again, we're not sugarcoating or romanticizing American history. There have been problems, obviously, but you know, people don't even know that. Most people, it's funny, Cabe and I were talking about the summer camp I worked at and, and went to and made a documentary mm-hmm. about, Kami Camp, uh, the camp is Kinderland. And, you know, I, uh, that was, they were part of the, they were kind of affiliated with the Communist Party. And there were a lot of civil rights, um, there was a lot of civil rights organizing that the Communist Party did. They were involved in anti-lynching campaigns. Um, mm-hmm. And they did see, you know, it's interesting because they really did see, um the value of both like of intersectionality, as you said, before that word existed. And they both saw the connection, obviously, between among different struggles. But they also had um, there was the International Workers Order, which was kind of the like social Ooh. branch mm-hmm. of the of the CPUSA. And they had within that like the Jewish People's Fraternal Order, uh, the like Slavic order, like they 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 recognize that on some levels, some organizing had to be done, um, like some by community. Uh, so it's just an interesting right. But they also had these 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 coalitions. But I want to ask you about when you're talking about the the you know we're saying basically economic justice is necessary and really important, but but doesn't cover everything, right? Um, what are ex- right. examples of things that need to be done that are outside the economic justice uh, kind of framework? Well, I mean, when we're talking about part of I think it's twofold, right? Like, So, so I, I appreciate, because a lot of people, I find, are willing to admit that, yes, there are systemic issues in the system. So a lot of times, and even this has an economic component, which is why I tell people that it has to be both in, right? right. We have to have a both in approach to our, to our work, to our coverage. As, as you know, folks in the media, to as organizers, to our organizing and building and discussion, like you know, that's what I know. And I know for every everyone's like, oh my god, intersectionality. It, but it's a fitting word that explains kind of what we're talking about when we're looking at the intersections of these different systems of oppression in our in our work. And so, I mean, prime example, a lot of folks talk about is you know, with police brutality right. and instances of police brutality, the disproportionate, you know. A, a, a rate of black and Latino, well, primarily black men, black women, black youth in, 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 the, in the justice system, whether we're looking at just, you know, um, the criminal justice system, whether we're looking at the school to prison pipeline, you know, these are things. And there's some, but there's some interaction of economics and class right. there as well. You know, myself, my kids as, you know, lawyers' kids, while they're not immune to this stuff happening, they may be less likely to have to deal with certain factors because their mom is a lawyer 
their dad is an iron worker, you know, their parents are very active, they're in a two-parent household, they're active engaged. So there is a class aspect there too, right? So my kids may be less likely to have certain experiences than, you know, their, their counterparts who maybe are in single-parent homes, you know, or, 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 or economically disadvantaged in various ways. So that's why I say it has to be both in. It's not, it's not okay, economic justice is not enough, so we all have to do this other thing. Like, we, we really have to start looking at the intersections. I mean, if we're talking about immigration at times, mm-hmm. right, immigration issues, economics, we have people who work, who pay taxes. I was just reading um, a, a story of a dad, I can't remember if it was Ohio, who's being deported, and he didn't violate anything. He hasn't committed a crime. He's being deported, but he has worked full-time the whole time he's been here. He pays his taxes, takes care of his kids. You know, so, so we have different levels of work that is happening that requires our attention that we can't just, economics is not going to solve it. Right. You know, like even with, with reproductive justice issues, that is a, a component of that. I had someone tell me before, well, I'm talking about economic issues. Reproductive justice is the economic issue. Right. Whether we frame it that way or not, it is access to reproductive health care, affordability. There's so much that goes into it. So, so a lot of the issues are economic justice issues, but economic justice is a race issue. You know, they intertwine. They're, right. they're, they're, they're so intrinsically linked to the inception of the creation of the country that we can't separate them into these false silos the way we do and actually be really successful in a sustainable manner in our work going forward. So, I mean, even with education, right, education is an economic issue, but it's also a race issue. There was a study from, I think it's the University of Chicago Consortium of School Reform. I couldn't have that name jumbled a bit, but University of Chicago has a consortium, research consortium, um, and, and I remember when I was working in Chicago right out of the law school, I did nonprofit public housing and public education law mm-hmm. policy, and one of the reports I found, they were looking at similarly situated neighborhoods in Chicago, right? So they were, you know, holding for in- income. So even when you were adjusting for income, you still had students who might have been in black, you know, well-off households who were still going to schools that were considerably underperforming versus their white counterparts on the, on the north and northwest side of Chicago. So there is another component, and that that is Chicago gets into the history of housing segregation right. and other and, and, and development segregation as well. So there there are aspects of it that are economic, but it's it's also racial as well. So we can't separate that. I mean, when we have a when we have a country that still has not remedied the fact that it federally incentivized racial segregation in housing with the creation, you know, with the Federal Housing Administration, um, we, we, we had we had the creation of the, 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 the suburbs, you know, the creation of the highways in many aspects, destroying communities. Yes, that was economic, but it was also racial. Right. You know, so there, so there, are, there are levels, there are levels to this conversation historically, and we don't, we don't remedy this by, you know, hashtag BLM, right. and that's not a diss when I say that, that's not a diss to the Black Lives Matter movement. I, I appreciate the work that's been done. That is just saying that for those people who consider themselves allies to certain work, simply having on a Black Lives Matter button or shirt or hashtag BLM in your, in your profile does not alleviate you of the burden that is involved in doing this work. Yeah, and there's a really... That's not enough. There's a really... I, I, I wish I remembered it. I'll look it up, but... I remember this Ta-Nehisi Coates uh, statistic and one of his articles about reparations that looks at the housing discrimination. Something about how, like, Mm -hmm. even when, um, you know, white people and black people have the same income, like the the houses there they can afford is different um, Mm -hmm. or the value of the houses that they can afford, I guess, because, you know, they're they're not given the the bank loans or they're not given, you know, they don't get accepted by the co-op or whatever reminded me of like a Chris Rock uh, observation that he had that um, he uh, he lives in a very nice neighborhood and it's like him and uh, I'm going to throw mm-hmm. out other celebrities, but it's like him and uh, Beyonce and uh, and uh, like Magic Johnson. And uh, yeah, and then all of the white people are dentists. Uh-huh, and he's right. like, we have yeah. to be the yeah. best. <laughs> I can't remember right. who else it is that's in the neighborhood, but yeah, right. <laughs> it's like all of them are superstars, and then their neighbors are like dentists or doctors or whatever, yeah. And he's like, we have yeah, to be exactly. the, the best to just be what you guys are just normal. Right. Or average. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what are policy? I mean, how much of this is an issue of framing and acknowledging um, multiple levels of oppression and that it's not just class and how much of it is also about policies. And if it's about policies, what are the policies that need to be pushed that are kind of, uh, related to class stuff, but not purely class things? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That is so, that's such a huge question. I think it depends upon 
I think it depends upon, you know, the area and the topic. Like I said, I definitely think when we're pushing for Medicare for all, which is why I'm really bothered by some of the, the, the pushback, yeah. you know, about how these issues are not black issues. I really think that, that, that some of the policies that we should be focusing on, I mean, I think it's both, right? So it is a part of the framing in our work and how we're doing things and whether or not we're going to engage and build within certain communities. And one of, like part of the advice that was given to me last year, I got to meet Dr. Reed um, last year when the when the nurses were doing the big red buses, right? When- uh, Adolph Reed or? Yeah, Dr. Adolph Reed. Okay. So I got to meet Dr. Adolph Reed last summer or last spring, last spring ahead of the primaries. Um, and so we sat and we talked because he also had did work in Chicago around um, the demolition of like Cabrini Green and Henry Horner and stuff. And so during his interview, and my question was about how do we – make sure that the movement that these different organizations and stuff are taking these issues, you know, of racial justice, et cetera, into consideration, right? Beyond just this missing that as an policy. And one of the things that he said, which I which I absolutely agree with, and I wasn't really sure where he was gonna go with his response, but his the major portion of his response was if we want to make sure that our issues are on the table and being addressed, we we have to make sure that we're seated at the table. And if folks won't quote unquote let us sit at the table, then we need to make room for ourselves at the table, right? And so I really appreciate that so because i know a lot of people with this stuff that has been going on you know recently with myself and challenging bad narratives i see within um our even our, our progressive independent media spaces like people say to me why do you even waste your time and energy you know in these spaces if people are stressing you out so right. much why why do, why do you waste your time talking to white people about race but i really do think that with, if i could because because I don't, it's not that I don't like white people. It's not that I'm, I'm stressed out and, oh, my God, all people are the devil and they're evil. That's the farthest from the truth. What it really is is I really believe in all of us working together and building a better tomorrow and building better work. For my work in, for when I lived in West Virginia, I mean, I saw this very, very clearly living in Appalachia, you know, spending time, you know, with, with folks. I really saw my favorite expression now is from the hood to the holler. I really see the, the commonality, right, in our struggle. There are different layers and different historical reasons for the oppressions that our individual communities are facing, but there is a thread of commonality that if we can find a way to work together and build, we really can push the needle and have something amazing happening on a, on a consistent, systematic, and sustainable basis across the board. I, I appreciate the conversations I get to have with folks from back in West Virginia and and, and, and and North Carolina and other areas because when we start talking about the way we grew up, some of the structural issues, you know, struggling single mom, things of that nature, like, it's like, wow, we grew up very similarly. Mm. There are other issues. And, and, and I appreciate in those conversations when people can acknowledge that there are also racial differences. Right. Like, I had a great conversation with Jack Jeskins, um, who is with the Kanawha County DSA. He's one of the co-founders of the Kanawha County DSA. That's back in West Virginia, the county around Charleston. We did a podcast last month when I was my kids go up there for the summertime. But um, we were talking about it, and he was just talking about how – you know, we were talking about the issues, and again, we're talking about, you know, really impoverished communities, but for, for someone from who, who has helped organize in impoverished areas, to recognize that even here, they have issues with redlining, right? Mm. They had city funds that were set aside to help develop um, a couple of different areas of, the, of their metro area, of what's called their metro area, it's not very big. <laughs> right. But anyway, like, there are two areas, though, that, that were the lower-income Black communities that were supposed to get certain targeted funds. And the city, like literally, there was a map he said that had red lines drawn, red circles drawn around these two neighborhoods, and they decided that they weren't putting the funds there. They were going to put the funds in downtown, and there's a rebranding of this other, you know, downtown living area, which is going to be disproportionately, you know, white and money. And so it's and so these issues are happening on level. So no one is saying that we don't have to address what's happening, you know, in terms of you know poor white impoverished communities instead let's focus on community colors what we're saying is we have all of these issues we got to find a way to grapple with them so i think katie it is both an issue of framing in our work which is why i do like i'm um, shout out to katina mooney and, and and much love to, to, to paula Dean. paula Dean is running against joe manchin and oh, really yeah. taking us dust and i think she i think she's sending him running scared but i really appreciate talking to these folks from back in west virginia and other in other places um i just met a professor joshua i think his last name is wiley He's in North Carolina, and he has a blog called This Appalachian Life, mm. um, which is a really great blog, and, 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 and the insight and introspective. So what I really do think of it's, it's, it's a couple of different things. Like, yes, we need to change the framing and the way we're engaging on these issues and how we're communicating with people about them. And then 
I mean, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's not going to be comfortable having some conversations. It's going to take all of us to kind of work together through periods of discomfort, right? I mean, but we do that with our families. Right. Um, it's not always hockey dory, you know, all, all, all dandy, fine and dandy when you, you come together with your family to deal with issues. But you, you move through it because there's value in moving through it to a better resolution. But in terms of policies, I mean, I think that framing and working together helps us have better policies. I mean, there's stuff right now. There's a group nationally that has been calling for a moratorium on charter schools, particularly as they pertain to black and Latino communities um, and low-income communities. I mean, there, there are so many different issues. I think really, though, if we start with the framing and how we're building, then that helps us have better, honest conversations about what we're trying to address. Then we can be advocating for better policies, can be advocating for candidates who will, who will, who from the ground that we've built that support, who can then go, you know, advocate and demand certain policy changes on our behalf as well. So I think it's 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 a whole uh, effort that we have to start working and building on. Right. I mean, I think the family analogy that you just gave is really, really good Um, because it doesn't mean that they're not problems. Right. But at the same time, I I mean, if we want to use that as a kind, not to sound cheesy. Right. But like. We can't totally isolate from other people. Like, I always bring this up, but there, to me, there's kind of like two levels of working with people who aren't already there, you know, like aren't already mm-hmm. with us. And one of them is, especially when you're talking about like West Virginia, like I, they're, they're, the liberals have such a lack of empathy when it comes to, I mean, okay, lots of liberals are racist, uh, either Usually, <laughs> they you, are, of course. Right, yeah. In their class, but you tell too. Well, that's okay. That's what. So what, they're covert in their racism and they're over in their classism, I think. Oh, yeah. Right? So they don't even yeah. have the empathy uh, to, to, to at all kind of understand where an undereducated, low income white worker uh, who isn't woke. And will say problematic things like there's no understanding of why that will happen. And so there's an empathy gap. Right. But then there's also a strategic gap. Right. Because let's say and I always say this, it's a little harsh, but let's say that I'm a total snob. I don't care about these people. I make jokes about how they don't have any teeth, blah, 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 blah. I should also if I care about like defeating Trump, which liberals do or claim to do. But I some of these people for demographic reasons need to be reached. I just mm-hmm. don't understand the the resistance to 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 reaching out to people or and also this pre- representation of it. It's such a false dichotomy. Like, oh, if Bernie Sanders talks to what to to coal miners uh, who are largely white in whatever neighbor, in whatever area, he's throwing people of color under the bus. How is that? I just don't see it. I think you can do it in a way that throws people under the bus. I think Donald Trump does it right. in that way. And I think historically we've seen a lot of that with Dixiecrats. Um, and kind of a racist populism, but I don't think that's what Sanders is doing. No, and I think this is why this is why I I really advocate for the so-called progressive movement by people who who exist in these spaces to 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 be the ones to lead and and have this dialogue, right? Yeah. Because the extreme criticism that comes from certain factions, while there might be some valid critique or validity to some aspects of what's being said. It is completely overblown and over and un, excuse me and unchecked because they can't right because there isn't there is an unwillingness. I've had people say you know in, in, in other discussions like no 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 we can't really do this conversation because it'll just give people more ammunition against Bernie and against Lumen. Right. But we have to really be the ones to have this conversation because we can do it with the nuance and 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 and, and the real depth that is necessary, right? Like so so I will say that that Bernie Bernie's over tendency to go to certain areas versus others is viewed as not caring about other groups, right? Like so Bernie's been to West Virginia, I don't know, like four times now, maybe since the election or something like that, in Kentucky. He's been been several places. But he hasn't necessarily been to places like well no, he's been to Columbus. And he went right? to mobile but he hasn't mobile been to like, what was it? Is it Alabama, the the phone workers? That was a large yeah, black. Yeah, and he did right, and he did he did go down to Mississippi. Um, he has gone, but he has not been back to Flint, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which which I was there was a there's a there's an activist I can't remember her name, but she got a chance I guess to ask Hillary Clinton a question recently, and her question was about you know you made all these promises and you had not been back. So let's not you know if anyone's listening, let's not no I don't believe in letting Hillary or the Democrats or anyone right. off the off the hook. But we spend so much time 
ra- railing at the Democrats, railing at the DNC, railing at Hillary Clinton and her, her poor, poor, poor campaign. We do need to do some self-reflection right. because we really do hold the key and really are a better alternative to the masses of people who have been disenfranchised and left out by this process for far too long. And we don't do that by ignoring concerns and saying, oh, we can't talk about that because we don't want to make Bernie look bad. This isn't about Bernie, right? right? So I appreciate what you're saying because you're right. I don't, I disagree. I don't, I mean, I disagree with that sentiment that because Bernie goes and has a town hall discussion with folks in certain areas, because what people don't understand is that some of these places, when you're talking about a Charleston, West Virginia, for example, right, you're talking about a, a, a metro regional area between Charleston and Huntington that has a large port, even though it's a small portion overall of the state population, but we talk about most of the black people or the Latino people in the state of West Virginia, they're going to be in that metro regional area. So if Bernie is going to those places, like I understand people get concerned because he, he has a focus on rural, and right. I understand why that is bothersome to some folks, but at the same time, what people overlook is that there are people of color, there, we, we exist in rural America as right. well. Right. So if we don't have people actually, because like recently, you know, Joy Reid or someone was making a comment about how we just need to focus on urban areas. Okay, but when they say focus on air urban areas, because they don't mean focus on the low income working communities in urban areas, they mean focus on certain people in urban areas. Mm. Because we've already seen how in Democrat held Detroit, they had all those machines that were broken and that weren't counting votes properly. And you see all these, I mean, you guys in New York had issues during the right. primary, right? With, 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 with polling places opening late. I mean, we've had it here in Atlanta with people changing their polling locations at the very last minute, you know, long line. So we have tons of issues that the Democrats themselves are not willing to address or really work on and just kind of scoff at and leave it to nonprofits or other groups to try to find a way and make it work. So there's a whole host of issues that need to be addressed. But I, I think that we have to be the ones to really be willing to be uncomfortable mm. to have this conversation. Because if we have the conversation, they have they have very little ammunition. The fact that the progressive movement has doubled down, especially during the primary, people spend so much time sharing pictures of Bernie Shane to a black woman versus being really, really able and willing to go in on those issues right. that gave them a whole like i mean because even all that nonsense with with k-part and the pictures and the false pictures and the real pictures and all that that should never have been an issue but it became an issue because people relied so heavily on imagery versus right. actually understanding the talking points the, the the conversation that needed to happen so we need to lead that conversation we have to have it because we're the leaders we're the ones that are really driving and pushing for a change and not just you know going back to the status quo good old days right. of the clinton 90 totally yeah like, i mean yeah i think you're right that it's like biography isn't enough but it i mean if people fall yes. for that stuff so we have to do both right i think we have to do both we That's like true. show yes. what happened because people respond to imagery but also we do have to explain, yeah. look, this is why when you fight for the $15 an hour or you fight for health care, you are doing racial justice and gender justice, too. Um, but I think what you said is Absolutely. really important, which is that we have to hold kind of our own feet to the fire, to use a really weird and unappealing um, metaphor. But <laughs> we can do that while we say, I mean, I try to do this. It's like and basically uh, be like, look. Those people, like libs who are like just to over, you know, to use shorthand, it's like those people are totally full of it. They never make good faith arguments. So let's acknowledge that they're totally opportunistic and cynical, but that but we should also do the work, right, to make sure that we're like pushing ourselves to be as good as we can. I think, you, yeah, like we can do those two things at the same time. Also, I, I guess I want to distinguish between um People who feel like Bernie doesn't speak to them um, genuinely Mm -hmm. and who are from these communities uh, versus people who are very politically motivated, like someone who's not Mm -hmm. like a political operative or a blogger or a pundit who doesn't feel like they connect to Sanders. That's very different from someone who doesn't like his politics and doesn't believe in like universal programs and who's playing the um, social justice, racial justice, uh, not social justice, the racial justice and gender justice card, if you will, to, you know, weaken actual economic uh, justice that has Absolutely. racial and gender components to it. So we actually have to uh, wrap up. But thank you so much, Anoa Changa. And we're, you can find Anoa uh, on Twitter at? Uh, the Way with Anoa. Last, uh, the, the Way with A-N-O-A. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Anoa. All right. Bye, Bye. Katie.